welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Donnie B. All Day. Donnie is a knife reviewer on YouTube and a knife designer in the real world. His creations are available made to order from the Kukri House in Nepal. And he has a love of big knives, big beastly bowies and other types, like his recent Arkansas toothpick, which some call a short sword, but they are wrong. It is a big American knife and a butte. He can also throw anything with a point and make it stick. In fact, D-Bad's YouTube shorts are responsible for rekindling my interest in knife throwing. And actually, uh, if I do say so myself, I've been doing better than ever. So much so that my daughters are asking me to teach them. I've been watching them on YouTube for a while, and I've been looking forward to meeting Donnie for quite some time and talk knives. But before we do, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. Uh, also. If you like to would like to support the show, you can do so by going to Patreon. Again, you can scan the QR code or go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Donnie, welcome to the show, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's, it's it's real good to have you, and real good to meet you. And uh, you know, just just for so everyone knows, I first came in contact with your channel uh, on one of those um, I don't know in, insatiable tears for one certain kind of knife, and for me, that's the Bowie. And uh, I've I, I come in and out of different phases. Uh, I'm I was in a real heavy Bowie phase recently, and. Um, but the last Bowie phase, I started watching you, and um, you obviously have a love of this. Um, yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. So tell me, uh, actually, bef before we even get to your love of knives, I also want to congratulate you on your recent design. As I mentioned up front, you design knives and have them made uh, by an amazing company, and you have something that you just released, the Arkansas Toothpick, and the that Arkansas is an impressive toothpick. knife. You know, what's funny is I actually have now um, two makers and another one, possibly coming around the board but but yeah uh the cooker house khhi is uh is responsible for making all my giant knives and the one you're talking about is right here this little tiny guy um it's just phenomenal phenomenal in the hand an amazing blade um but then there's croco knives that i have my second knife about to be uh it's going to be released pretty soon with them and I'm excited about that as well. Well, okay, so let's back up uh, to the to the very beginning. Where did this love of knives come from? As particularly this kind of big knife. My uh, my grandmother used to stab us as children. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, I see. It's a bonding thing. Family. <laughs> so yeah, and, you know, it, it's I, I we talked earlier, and where I live, we have a lot of woodlands. I mean, a lot of woodlands. I live out in the Berkshires. And uh, I just grew up in the woods. I grew up with knives. I grew up um, with anything sharp, really. And uh, when I was young, I would make my own my own weapons and, and things like that. I've been in martial arts all my life and doing weapons training. It, it's just it was something that it didn't just start one day. It was gradual sense. You know, you lost your first binky and you have to pick something up to make up for it. That's what I found. Yeah, I, 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 well, I, I can relate. I can certainly relate, especially to the part of just uh, not really knowing where it originated. I, I sometimes go back to a toy. My brother had a toy knife when we were like, like very, very little, very little, yeah. and I coveted it, you know, and, uh, but, you know, that's just me over analyzing. But uh, it's interesting to see how over time uh, an interest in knives builds. Yeah. Well, you know, Rambo happened. And once Rambo happened, came the, the the Rambo knife, the the 
typical Rambo survival knife. And then the late 70s, early 80s, we had these hollow handled pieces of crap that had a nut that held on a little screw in the bottom that broke and loosened every time you used it. And uh, it's just it, the passion just ignited thanks to Rambo. That very first first blood knife did it all. It, it, that's 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 what that's what took me from just really liking knives to to really having a passion for them. Uh, you know, it was very, uh, it, I mean, me too. Uh, for me, it was first blood part two, um, uh, Rambo, the first one I, I, I didn't quite see, uh, in the theater. I did, I just didn't see it at the time. It didn't, uh, wasn't exposed, but Rambo two first blood Rambo uh, first blood part two. Anyway, in, in any case, the thing that really bummed me out about uh, the popularity of the hollowed handled knives that came out shortly after that. And you remember, it's got a bottle opener cut into the back yeah. of the blade, very yeah. cheap with a saw blade clip point, uh, was that it looked nothing like the actual Rambo. No, it all, all it had in common. Hand on it it yeah. was just a steel handle. <laughs> the the yeah. compass on the, uh, I was on the outside and just, it was a bubble compass. Yeah. And the way you were so saying, horrible. it was a zero tang with a nut, you know, yeah, just like yeah. held down. That's all it was, was a little screw head. So, uh, so you saw these movies and, uh, and, and so that's when you started really getting into them and collecting. And I thought I'm already jumping out of trees. Why not do it with a knife? So, you know, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, amen. And what, what could, what could speak to like independence more than that? Right. Right. Exactly. I mean, he was so independent. I mean, they threw him in jail. Then he was stuck in a cave. He was so independent. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, okay. Before we get to how you, how you design and kind of what, where it, where it comes from and what your process is, uh, you served in the military, correct? Yeah. Yeah, man. I, I was, a. Uh, U.S. Army, man. I'm a nine-year combat vet and all that jazz. Two-time decorated American hero, and and uh, I got to, I got to to get my swing of things going on, you know. Yeah. Well, so thank it was, you. It was fun. It was fun. On behalf of uh, on behalf of me and my family, thank you for your service. Well, on behalf um, of me and me, it was all pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad you could derive that. So. I, I am imagining that your experience in combat um, must really have shaped, um, I don't know, there must be a before combat and after combat idea of the ideal knife. Um, do you, can you tra track that? No. Uh, <laughs> um, no, the, the knife I was issued isn't something I would have chosen, but once I got it and used it, then I'm really glad I had it. But my, my knife mind before going to combat was already was already there. I mean, I went in late. Um, I did 12 years of law enforcement. I was a rescuer at Ground Zero in New York, and oh, it, wow. I burned my eyes, my feet, my hands, and my lungs at Ground Zero. And once I healed up, I, I healed up at 35 years old. I joined the Army immediately and um, volunteered for combat, and that's how I ended up there. So I already had like a world of experience going into it. Um, you know, I, I guess I'd say if my, my, the way I saw knives change probably was because I was a boy scout early on and you go from, this is a badass knife to, okay, this is how I start a fire. And so that's when it really started to click, you know, it was when I was younger. So, um, I, I, in law enforcement, uh, I'm not even sure how, you know, I know a lot of uh, police officers through my job and they carry folders uh, mostly. But yeah. so how how is a, a law enforcement officer? Um, you you said you're a policeman, police officer. Uh, I was a constable and I was a park ranger even. Oh, cool. Yeah. All it was right. A wild, fun job. I bet, man, especially I was an animal control officer and um, I was a bounty hunter. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, which really? which bounty hunting, I have to say, of all of them was next to next to animal control. It was probably the second most fun bounty hunting. My last um, my last bounty hunt, um, the last thing I had to serve was in uh, in Spanish Harlem, New York. And uh, we went out there with a team and it we just had a blast chasing this guy down. It was <laughs> it was ridiculous, but we got him. <laughs> 
Wait, well, okay, okay, okay. What is it like? I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think I've ever met a bounty hunter in real so life. So this is what it's like. It's really boring because you're just looking. You're looking for them, looking for them, looking for them. It doesn't get fun until you actually find them. But um, just the, it, what made it so fun was the team I, I was with. Um, we had a couple guys. One guy, he's an older guy. His name was Angus. This guy was like 70 years old, wore a beret. He was like all Scottish. He looked like he just came out of a parade, like a Scottish parade. <laughs> and uh, he looked like that all the time. He had the big fat mustache. He was just this cool dude. And then there was my partner was with me and, and we just, we just, man, we went at it and, and had a blast. And, you know, I was like, I was always the guy that's going to do the tackling. I was always, you know what I mean? I was that guy. So Angus, who's 70, he just knew where to point us. And it was like point, click, go. And that's what he did. He just sent me loose. He's like, that's the one. And it was fun, man. It was so much fun. Once you got to that point outside of that, it was so boring. There's nothing more boring than a stakeout. Nothing. So were you, uh, were you doing, um, before, before you actually found the guy, were you kind of doing the same sort of uh, mental legwork that um, Angus was doing or sleuthing or no, were you just kind of waiting I, around I did, for the, I did this much of the legwork, um, but I did this much of the get them. Um, it was my cuffs on them. It was, it was me who was made first contact. Um, but all everything, like the game plan, the setup, everything was Angus. This, the guy was a genius when it came to this. I was just a lackey. So, but, but I would imagine you have to be tough as hell, tough as nails to do a job like that, but also have a real love for that kind of confrontation, that kind of, um, you know, yeah, you, situation. You have to, you have to have known what it's like to punch somebody in the face in your past and, and know that, Somebody's going to be trying to punch you in the face real soon. But um, it, yeah, that's what makes it exciting is, and, and being a big guy, a lot of times like this last guy, he was a stocky dude, but he was like five, eight. So when he went chest to chest with me, he pretty much knew he was about to get messed up if he did. So, so it actually went real easy. It was, re I mean, the guy, once he was caught, it was like, all right, all right, all right. You know, there was no, I would love to tell a special story about how he pulled out a knife and I got had to throw him when he gets a wall and there was a big glass breakthrough. No, no, he gave <laughs> up real quick, real quick. Yeah, I bet that's where um, size comes in handy. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. You, you you might be smaller and, and able to to handle yourself. But you don't want it to have to come to to proving it, you know. If yeah, you kind of walk in I mean, and... and and I had backup behind me, so I mean, he was he was pretty smart. He was pretty smart. He he knew he was being chased. He knew he was supposed to be hiding, and he was hiding in a uh, in a, a car rim shop. His cousin's tires and rims. It was a little <laughs> tiny shop, which is crazy because walking through Spanish Harlem, it was like live chickens, live chickens, live chickens car audio live chickens live chickens car tires it was like the weirdest thing all the stores were set up but um yeah it was uh it was it was it was fun man it was fun going in once once it was point and click then i'm on that's my game so when you're when you're doing that um uh can you go armed can you carry a knife or is that no well, uh, forbidden? You're, well a knife i mean you're not really some, i was it was since it was spanish Harlem, new york we had to go by new york laws oh god uh, right. the only time i ever carried in new york was at ground zero um that was the only time i went in full gear um but as far as bounty hunting no 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 you don't carry no gun and if you have a knife don't leave it exposed you're just a bounty right. hunter you have no real anything you know what i mean so yeah. if the police really say I don't, they, they can tell you, I don't give a crap what you are. I mean, you're just a bounty hunter. That's it. So, yeah. and, and generally a lot of bounty hunters um, were either ex, ex military or ex police. A lot of them are, are just that way. Like Angus was ex law enforcement from Scotland. So he was like the Scottish police officer who came here and started that up. And, uh, and yeah, so they kind of respect a little bit, but most cops really don't care because they see you as lesser, which, in yeah. reality, I'm not gonna lie. As a bounty hunter, you are. You're not. You're not right, right. out there doing the daily thing like a, a police officer is. I'm not pulling people over and getting shot at all the time. Yeah, and you haven't sworn an oath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bounties they come once in a while. It's not an everyday thing, you know. Okay. So this wasn't like nine to five. Okay, we got these seven to go get. No, it was like <laughs> right. all right. Took two weeks, we found one. 
you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's how that went. That's so then you go from that kind of experience, which is, uh, seems like it'd be a pretty hair raising, uh, kind of thing for the faint of heart. And then you go, um, and then later you're, you're in combat. So, um, the knives you end up designing afterward, you know, you, you're, yeah. you're, you begin to do that. What, first of all, when did you start actually designing in earnest? Um, for my first real design was the preacher. Um, I know I have that here. Um, and, and what's special about this one is I wanted to, cause every, every knife design out there, if I pulled out this one, my Rambo three, this knife design has been done a thousand times by a thousand people. It's nothing special. My job was just to make it better, more balanced, this and that there's a jillion kukris. This one, obviously a little different, but it's still a kukri, right? There's a, a lot of the blade designs that I have are historical, um, I mean, if nobody's ever seen this, then they live oh. under a rock. So yeah, yeah, wait, 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 Don, not so fast. Show this off. Let me see this thing. But yeah, continue, continue with what you were saying. Though. This is my version of the Muso buoy, right? And my, it, it was my grail knife was a, a real Muso. The problem is they usually come with like some kind of stick or, um, mm. or a little screw job in there. And they, they kind of suck in the, in the handle. It's just glued on nothing or a little screw on the inside. It's really crappy. You get some kind of rat tail. So my deal was I wanted to make historically equal from here to here. I wanted it to be historically correct. And that's exactly what I did. This is actual act, the actual size, 100% from here to here as the original um muso buoy and um I, I wanted to make sure that that was capitalized so when i hold it and i look at it from my hand up i'm looking at exactly what jim buoy would have looked at that except mine instead of brass is steel and it's welded on not glued on and it's black instead of polished that's the only difference but it's the handle that makes this one difference true full tank construction uh, micarta scales and the contouring and the size of the handle make everything. It is completely measured out mathematically to be 100% correct. And um, that's what makes this one so special. Otherwise, it's just another Muso buoy, to be honest. But it, it's it, this from here to here and the way it's done um, hasn't been done by anybody else. It's weird. This camera's backwards. I'm losing myself. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so when I did the preacher, the preacher, this is, this is a, like a one-off type design. There's every kind of knife you can think of has already been done. It's just, they're overused, done designs, but it's because they work. So we're going to keep overusing them and keep just, now it just comes to making it better or making it your own. With this one, I went with a modified predator tip, which means instead of a true clipper, a predator tip is straight. It's two angular lines. I went with a slight curve, but oh. to bring it down just short. So it's a really short clip with a really short belly. So you have a small waist with a high belly, but it's a three chira knife. And that's these grooves right here, right? Mm -hmm. So the three chiras are for shock, uh, to absorb shock and all that. And just, it, it just, but what it changes on the weight. And this one is the prototype. And um, so you can see how really... Oh fat it is it is a big thick knife and what i did different is in the is in the finger choil the finger choil is backwards so people will get it and they'll put their finger in here and say oh it's a little uncomfortable but it's not made for that it's made for this and so is the angle of the of the grip it's made to hold your pinky in a perfect placement so when you're grabbing the knife in a fighting position you have a perfect grab so what what's so special about this one is this is nobody's else, nobody else has ever done this blade design this is my own blade design and it's really hard as a designer to come up with something new it's like the guy developing the next car it's like okay yeah. it's four tires it's got a hood in a trunk it's been done um so for this one this one really set it off because i designed it for me personally i wanted something that nobody else on the planet had and uh i came up with something that nobody else had the problem is i did a video on it saying hey check out my new knife and then I just got tons of people. I want one. I want one. I want one. And so 
once I had 50 people saying that they're ready to order one and I was giving them the design to send to Kukri House. And I, I talked to the guys over there and I said, listen, I said, I got a lot of people asking. I said, I have more designs. Why don't we just come together and, and you can do a page and you can sell my designs. And they're instant. They're like, well, hell yeah. So, <laughs> so that's how it all got started was with this knife. This is, this is the knife that literally set D bad designs. It's was, it was supposed to be just a personal knife. I designed it because nobody else ever had, and I wanted it for me. And, um, it turned out to be really, really popular. Um, so that's, it's, that's how it all, that's how it all got started. That's, that's the work right there. So I just, I, I saw that knife first on uh scabs channel. Uh, yeah, Choir he, Boys he's, cutlery. he's used his more than anybody else. Beautiful. And, and then, um, <clears throat> Oh, well, okay. So uh, there are a couple of things I want to ask from, from what you were just talking about. First of all, the predator tip on that is referring to the predator, the predator machete that, that they yeah, all remember had. Remember the machete with the straight yeah. cut? And the, yeah. It had a linear linear cut down instead of a swoop. Yeah. And then it was just a straight line all the way to the tip, a small cant in the line. Yeah. So what I wanted to do is I, I love the predator tip, but I'm not so so much of a fan of linear knives. So I wanted to change it just a little bit and it has to be, had to be short. I didn't want a long one. And you see a lot of predator tips where people cut it and cut it. So I said, how can I do a predator tip, but to my liking to, to how I wanted it. So I just gave it a curl and I shortened it. And it's basically like taking a drop point knife. Like if I was to take, let's see where, so if I was to take this knife, which is a drop point. And this knife, you can see aside from the size, they're almost similar up until that little right. break oh, on this one, on that little break right there, tip for tip. They're pretty close except for that. And so it was basically a drop point knife that I changed into a clip. So I just wanted to play with it and, and just literally do something nobody else had done. Um, okay, so you were you were talking also about the um, uh, oh yeah, and and for sure when I first saw that knife, a I recognized that it was pretty unusual, you know, clip point, yeah, uh, but everything else about it, you know, yeah, especially the I can't remember the term you called it, but those giant chira. fat yeah chiras. Chira is something used. Um, it's famously from uh, Nepal, and what they do is they put scallops along the blade. And it's to absorb shock when they hit. Right. And it looks like it might add rigidity too, like an it, IB. It absolutely does. It's, it's arches. Um, so, uh, but uh, what, oh, geez, now I'm getting lost. So there's that. Oh, but also you were talking about the Muso Bowie. Uh, yeah. So now every knife you hold up, I'm like, maybe I'll get that one instead. No, maybe I'll get, and then I'm like, first of all, I don't have to just get one. A and B, <laughs> it just goes to show like you and I have, uh, I think, similar taste. I, I, I really dig your designs. Uh, that Muso that you were holding up, beautiful blade. But yeah, what does what does Muso mean? M-U-S-S-O. It, it's actually a name. It, it, there's there's two people that were believed to have designed it, even three. People talked about Resin, um, who is Jim's brother. Um, and then they talk about James Black and they talk about a guy whose name is Muso. And so there was huge controversy in who actually designed the original knife. And because so many people thought it was Muso or believe it to be Muso, um, it just commonly became called the Muso buoy. So that's how it just got the name. But it was my grail knife. I, I actually got to see what's said to be the original. It was in a museum in, um, in Texas. I was down there and they let me in after hours to go and get a mm. really close up look at it. And I, it just put me in knife heaven. And so I knew when I took pictures of it, I knew that I needed to make this exactly what i saw and that's that's why it is what it is it's beautiful is that uh clip a uh, zero ground sharp what's that oh is, no no it, no this is just swedged uh -huh. um so you're not going to cut yourself on that um and like i said the, the original was the same way it was swedged as a matter of fact the point where the swedge starts is exactly where the original is the point uh -huh. from this tip to this is exactly where the original is the distance that uh, 
the distance from where this curls up to where the spine is, is exactly as the original is. So when you're looking at the blade down, aside from colorations, and here would be brass color and here would be mm -hmm. polished, um, aside from color, you're looking at Jim Bowie's knife. And uh, I that was the most important thing to me was to make it historically accurate in the important part to see, yet yeah. extremely strong and comfortable and the most important part to hold. So well, what do, what, what do they what do they think the handle or what did the handle look like in the original? Uh, the handle on the original, I don't have anything next to me, um, but it was basically more similar to this, but mm. not true full tang. So it was just gotcha. it was just a piece of wood, and it had a little bump in it, boom. But it was fat at the bottom, and then it got itself thinner with one little finger uh, swell in it, and that was it. But it was. Okay. It was just a burn in where they they basically took a triangle tang and burned it, you know, heated it up real bad yeah. and stuck it through the wood and glued it. And that's how they got it. It wasn't it wasn't really secured. There was nothing like this. Right. It didn't go right. all the way to the end, you know. Yeah. Um, so on that Musso and, and you see this a lot on uh, that style of of Bowie knife. Um, that back strap, in your case, it's steel on the original. You said it's brass. brass. What's that for? The brass is for absorbing shock from an enemy's weapon. So brass is soft. So if somebody was to hit and you were hitting, let's say you're holding the knife in a reverse, a reverse fighting grip, which is holding it so where the edge is out and you can bang a person's weapon and then come through with a thrust, um, it would take the shock away when you hit and then uh. move through. And it would save your blade from possible cracking and chipping. Right. That is so cool. I, yeah, I these guys, love... these guys, this happened so long ago. It's, it, they're just geniuses, yeah. you know, that never got credit for being geniuses. You know, it, it looks like a saber, you know, you can really see uh, some, uh, you know, in some styles of Bowie, you can see a sort of saber um, influence yeah. and, and in some, you know, it's kind of hard to do research on Bowie fighting styles, but in a lot of fighting styles that i've seen there's a lot of kind of saber like you know motions and and that back cut and and right. it's just very interesting to think that we have an american style of knife fighting right and the, and the saber is actually what prompted the confederate army to to mm. use things like this or the guys in the south um who first created the d guard it was so they can fight from horseback that's why it's it was so long and um but it was it was absolutely the 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 cutlass that that prompted this design, and um, it just became such an, a, a famous weapon and a, a needed piece in history for the for the Southerners. Um, it was just a monster monster fighting tool. When you're coming riding full out on a horse and you swat, yeah. this thing will remove a head, oh, and yeah. um, and that's why I wanted it because the 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 past. In this design, like if you look at mine, what separates it from the originals, I use the same shape for a lot of the guards that you'll see historically, the same shape in the D guard. My D guard is really strong, really thick. It is true full tang instead of what they did is use a rat tail. And then they screwed this onto the rat tail. Mm -hmm. With my knife, this is just pretty much for show. The the tang is pretty much welded, welded onto there. And this is that. It's really because I wanted some kind of historical accuracy in the rear. I could have left it off, but it's on there just because the originals would have had some kind of little acorn nut or some kind of nut mm -hmm. to hold the knife in. Yeah. Um, but obviously this is true full tang. So this knife's not oh. going anywhere from the scales, but it, it, it just needed that. It just needed that realistic look and, but with it's also a for, force multiplier on a on a back fist, you know, strike. Oh too. yeah, yeah, without a doubt, it's. I wouldn't want to get hit by it. Oh man. Um. Uh. So. Um. The. Oh. Oh. Uh, so. You showed. This is something that's very interesting to me. Uh. You showed holding the Bowie in that reverse uh, grip with the spine right. facing outward. Uh, I've heard that called the Randall fighting method because I think some. Some people in World War II use their Randall number ones that way, right? Uh, because they all have that sharpened swedge, which right. But it, I love it, that. It, the thing is, it goes way back in history. This is yeah, like yeah, BC what, type history. 
Oh. And uh, so people who popularize it get to call it whatever they want. But yeah, it's it's that just it's just a reverse grip to where you're aiming the spine at, at another person's weapon. And the only reason is to protect your edge because your edge, especially when you're the fighting Genghis Khan's army and you're in the field, you need to keep an edge for as long as possible. And if you're mm -hmm. out there clashing weapons, guess what? Your edge is going to get screwed up. That's why, like, you see, it, it's very popular in movies with, um, you see the uh, samurai and the samurai would take their swords and you see them in these movies and they're having these 30 minute knife uh, sword fights. And it's like, Oh man, these are amazing. It's not how it was back then with a real samurai the, his, his katana was his lifeline. So he wouldn't want a chance ruining it or breaking it or ruining the edge. So what they would do is block strike. They would try to get a get a fight over within one to two moves any chance they could. They never had these big, long, extravagant. That's just all Hollywood. But um, to, to save your knife, a lot of times you would or your, your even your sword, you would turn. So you're not hitting directly with the edge when you're com combating against another sword. You're almost going sideways or closer to the edge of your spine. And then you'd, you'd react. It's just. Guys back then, they, they knew what it meant to rely on a blade, where today, blades are fun. Blades, you know what I mean? Blade, yeah. Unless you're a hunter and you're, or you're skinning, or you're doing, they don't really care. You're not thinking about going at somebody and having to preserve your knife for the next 300 days of fighting. You know? Yeah, right. So it's, it's a much different mindset now than it was back then. You know, I love thinking about, um, well, I love history and I love thinking about, um, you know, American knives, American, um, re well, I, I should say recently, um, when cold steel came out with their Arkansas toothpick and then, and, and I got one for my brother, uh, for Christmas and then yours came, you know, to, to you and you started showing it off. And I was like, man, the Arkansas toothpick, that is a knife that I never think of. I always think of the, the, the great and powerful Bowie and, and, you know, right. at, but, but there are other American designs. Uh, you know, you you showed the Confederate D guard. That is right, that is the, the classic old West buoy, the Western buoy, which I don't have one right here, but pretty close. It would be this style blade, right? So you have like the the, the case double X and the Western 49s. Mm -hmm. These things have gone back all the way as far back as the 1800s. They wouldn't have all that. It would pretty much look like this, right? Without the rest of it. But um it's a tried and true design that that has been back the 1836-ish area where you've seen a lot of these big buoys being carried um, and, and the, the long Arkansas toothpicks where you're finding, you know, 17 to 20-inch blades. Um, that's when these things really got popularized. Then when Western came out with their 49 model in 1849, um, a lot of people think it started there, but they go out, they go a lot farther back. People even even say, "Oh, it's the Marine Raider knife." That was a hundred years after the first ones were even, you know, were even uh, made. And so it, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's amazing. It's exactly it. That knife right there that you're holding, that design is a lot older than people think it is. And and uh, if you do some research, you can find some some really old ones that. I I don't know if I've seen any out of America that have the the exact same like handle style and all that, mm -hmm. but blade shape for blade shape, they've been out there for a long time. So the 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 W forty nine is actually eighteen forty nine. That is that is. I mean, I know mine is was made in nineteen eighty. I did the research and yeah. Uh, no wait, no. Uh, sorry, nineteen forty nine. It's <laughs> oh okay. I, I believe the is the Western nineteen forty nine. I don't know. I know 1836 is the earliest American made one I've seen. Yeah, I think, and, uh, I mean, it, it makes sense now, for me. Now you got me all jacked up. I don't know if it was 18 or 19. I, I, I mean, I, I believe it because I've seen, uh, you know, historical examples with blades that look exactly like this. Yeah. And then, and then the S guard you see sometimes. Um, yeah. But I mean, one of my favorite shapes, you actually did a, uh, a video recently on your channel, which we will talk about. Uh, but um you know, you're talking about best EDCable Western Bowies. And I'm like, man, I like the cut of this guy's chip. You know, he's talking about uh, Western Bowies as an EDC item, you know, love man, it. I'll tell you, if, if you're going to carry a big knife, carry the right big knife, make uh, it good agreed. looking. You know? So, so the, the history part of it though, uh, you know, I was talking uh, waxing poetic about American 
um, his, historical knives. But in general, you know, looking at your designs, there is you see a lot of Bowies and that kind of thing. But there are other things, too, like that very cool, uh, which I'd like you to show a uh, uh, sort of um, a nightmare ground um, kukri. Uh, there are other things up there. Uh, and and oh. also on your on your design page on your um, YouTube. Uh, this one page. right here. So this is the um, this is the D-Bad 12,000. And basically the Kukri house uh, who specializes in Kukri's, it's what they what they did until they found me. Um, they they asked me one time, they said, can you design like a badass camp Kukri, something that you can camp with? But it's a kukri. And I said, absolutely. So I drew up one and I didn't like the way it looked. And then I came up with this thing and I started liking it better. And, and here's the deal is people have been asking me forever to do a tracker knife. I hate tracker knives. I do. I just yeah. don't like them. So because I don't like trackers and because I needed a badass kukri that was camp, I said, well, why don't I just combine them? And rather than having a hard shift here where it goes up above the shift. Yeah. I went equal to it. And that way I feel better about it because it's not so ugly and people get their tracker. The Kukri house gets their Kukri and it pays homage to the 12,000 um, Gurkha soldiers who fought off the 30,000 British soldiers. Um, and they fought so hard and so well that eventually the British said, screw it. You can't beat them, join them and <laughs> brought the, you know, the military, yeah brought in Gurkha soldiers and that's how that all started. So it was, it was paying homage to, to the 12,000 Gurkha champions. These guys were just some of the best warriors on the planet. And, um, and while paying homage to them, I got to fit in a few other things like a tracker, a camp Kukri and yeah. put it all together and just keep it completely nasty. It had to be radical and badass and, and just tough, and I don't know. I think I got it there because it's sick. It's really absolutely, sick. absolutely. And you got a westernized handle in there, and you also yeah. Got... I, I I went with modern material. Yeah. Um, I went with true full tang, you know, and I went away from the classic kukri grip because it had to be camp worthy, and I wanted it to be yeah. as comfortable as a grip could be. And uh, and so that's what I did. You also I got that secondary point on there. Yeah. The only I have to say that my grips are, are my main focus when I when I am making a knife. My grips are everything. The only grips I have that I wouldn't put in that category are, and I know you are a Rambo two fan. Um, <laughs> when I redid the Rambo two, my version of it, I went with a typical round handle, and I thought about going with just a nice black handle, you know, black scales. But I really wanted the I really wanted the line going across, and I don't know. I just really, really had to go round. And even though I had to go round, I still made it slightly oval. It's not perfectly mm, round yeah. because I didn't want it to be shifting too much. Because I know a hundred percent that you're going to get shift with any kind of round. It's just going to happen. That's yeah. part of the game. So, but when I did my John Jay tribute, um, I was able to utilize some of the shape from the. Uh, MK8 knife from his last movie. Yeah. So I didn't have to go around. The hard stopper. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the hard, well, the hard stopper had that awful grip. I don't have that one with me because I bettered the grip, but the hard stopper had a sub hilt and it had oh, this jump in it. Yeah. I had to make that much better. So what this, this is a, a combination of four different movies. This represents the 10 inch blade from the second one. It, is more silver, more polished, like in first blood with green in the, in the handle. Um, the handle shape is from the MK eight and from the heart stopper. I've brought in that style of guard. So I wanted to pay homage to the first two last two movie knives. And that's how I came up with this thing. And I have to say it, it, it's winter, winter, chicken dinner, man. This thing is, this thing is really, really sweet. Um, great knife, but it's, it's, so it's, it's an homage paying knife is is the uh jade handle uh supposed to to evoke the jade uh thing that he had around yeah, his neck from part two yeah Dude, you're so, going deep with this i like yeah, it man. that's that's exactly what it was when i did the review <laughs> i actually had the little buddha jade from rambo i had one of those little buddhas and i ended up breaking it but um 
Yeah, that's exactly what that was. It was supposed to be from when the Asian girl gave him the the Buddha. Yeah. So so how do you how do you design? Are you a pen and paper guy or uh, uh, both? Both. Um, what I'll do is, and what a lot of people don't realize that I do, and it, it it's, makes it a lot harder. I don't use any special um, special programs on a computer. I don't have any things where uh, I draw it on a pad a lot of times, and then I'll take a picture of it, and then I'll take the picture and send it to my computer, and I'll erase the entire background, and then I'll take just the outline of what I drew, and then redraw it on your basic paint thing that you get on every computer for free. Uh -huh. That's what I use. I use paint. <laughs> no. and I, I, I your designs look. Designs. Your designs look pro, man. Uh, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of when, time. When you see a design of a folder, you expect to see it blown up and uh, you know blown apart and and right. you know all the 3D and the moving parts. But when you see a um, like look at that's beautiful. When, that's, when you see, that's gonna be, that's being made right now by Croco Knives. Croco that's gonna knives, be there's okay. gonna be a first production run of fifty of those. Uh, uh, what I was going to say is when you see these, you know, you know, they're, um, they're fixed blade and you don't need all of that. Like this, this looks really cool too. Um, what so, are the, what are the, does, uh, on a lot of the knives they have, they look kind of like saw notches, but I'm not sure. Are those for making traps and stuff or. Um, a, a lot of them are, a lot of them, well, it depends on the kind, like uh, on the first knife that you went past, it had these round ones, they're pinch serrations. So normally a serration is going to um, be single sided. So it'll go that way. And then mm -hmm. you'll have a point that goes one way and you can use those are saws. This one is for decoration. That's why I did not sawtooth it. Um, it's just an homage paid one. You can use it for um, uh, making fluff with, with a stick. Um, you can use gotcha. it for notching, things like that. But this one's just, just for, just for, for looks pretty much um some of them i make for um wound channeling and it's if you're going to have a wound once you go in and you turn and you pull back all those little teeth are pulling apart parts of skin and parts of hide that can't be fixed the internals are getting locked in there and you're just pulling things out of place because it's yanking on them and just it makes more of a mess it's why with the geneva, geneva convention came around no more saw teeth on knives because it was too rough for the enemies. Oh, but we're the only ones who follow that rule. So the enemies will use anything they want. Yeah, so it's, right. it's really freaking stupid. So when I, when I designed my new one that's coming out, I did what's called a pinch serration. So the serrations go both directions. So that way it, you can use it for braiding. So if you want to make rope or line, you can tie a knot and slip it through one of the little holes pull braid now you can make a stronger rope oh, cool. um, things like that and it'll be great for wound channeling but will it be legal for any u.s military to carry no but it, I, that's not what i designed it for i designed it for my perfect like if i wanted a combat knife what would i want in a combat knife and that's what i designed it for uh, so uh, I was going to ask you, what knife would you wish you had when you were in combat and weren't the designing one I just knives? Designed. And this is this one. <laughs> but okay. I got to say, um, I, I made this one to um, to fix what was wrong with the Ooh, K bar. That's beautiful. And I would take this over at K bar any day. I would bring this into combat any day of the week. Now, right behind me, you'll see an American flag boop up there mm -hmm. and a triangle. Inside that triangle is one of these, but it's signed by Rob O'Neill, the man Bin Laden. And oh, wow. Rob O'Neill loved it so much, I had to send him one and, and sign the sheath for him. And uh, he loves it. So Rob O'Neill actually carries, for his personal use, a D-Bad War Machine. So that the guy who kills Bin Laden yeah. has one of these. That is rad, man. Yeah, That's yeah, he's, he's a great dude. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about your channel. Um, so this this is a great, you know, it's great to have a channel. It's a great way to um, show off the designs you're making. But I don't think that's why you started it. No, um, not at all. I just. Yeah. Tell, the, tell me the, why you started it. What the exact you? reason. The, and I don't tell you the exact reason I started the channel. I think it was either my first video or my second video. I don't I don't even know. It was the case double X buoy. Right. Mm. And what happened is I wanted one. It was it was the knife. I Like, I had two grail knives my entire life. It was the Musso and the case, uh, that Western style, that Old West yeah. style. And um, what happened was 
I wanted to look up videos. I wanted to see how this thing performed. I wanted to see if it's really badass because they call it a presentation buoy. So I'm like, wait, does that mean you can't use it? And I had so many questions and every video I looked at, not a single person used it. Not one. Everything was tabletops. Oh, this is blah, 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 blah. That tells you nothing, nothing. If I, if I wanted to tell you how good a knife was and then not prove it, what have I shown you? Nothing. Mm -hmm. So I finally got so upset that I couldn't find a single, not one person just using it a little bit, just go out and use it a little bit. Um, <laughs> so I was like, well, screwed. I'm just going to spend the 200 bucks, whatever it is. And I'm going to chance it. And if it's good, it's good. If it's bad, it's bad. It's on me. So I got it. And I said, I'm going to actually film a video that way. There's a video on YouTube of one of these actually being used. And, uh, I started doing more and more and the people over at case contacted me when I had 50 subscribers, just 50. Um, and, uh, and they're like, look, normally we would not even give somebody a look who has 50 subscribers. They're like, but we see something in you. Like, Can we send you some knives? And I was like, yeah. So mm -hmm. case sent me some knives and, um, and that's what really, really pushed it. And there was another one. The SE six was one of my first knives that I, that I did on the channel. And it was it just I wanted a survival knife that for, for myself for camping this net. And I was searching, searching, searching for the perfect one. I, I really want this SE. So I got that, did it, and then the, the Kaiser hollow handle knife. And and those were like the first ones that, that got it started. And it was just I wanted to to take some of the knives that a lot of people weren't testing. Like there was tons of videos on the SE6. And I think I even mentioned it in that video. It might've been where I'm like, what can I tell you about the SE6 that you haven't already heard? Nothing. I just wanted to show you my take. So it, it, it's what really got it going. It was the fact that I went out there. I got a big personality. I'm loud and I'm, I'm an idiot. And I, I don't care what I swing and I don't care what I throw. I'll throw everything. Um, and it's just, people clang to it, clang to it. And then it just started to grow. And uh, once I seen people were appreciating somebody using some of the knives that other people weren't showing being used, then I said, all right, well, this is what people want to see. People want to see knives being used. So I, I looked at other videos and saw what people were either doing or not doing. And I said, well, how can I improve? Okay. This guy, this guy's got 200,000 followers. He's got the personality of a rock, you know? And it was like, that sucks. So you can't, you can't go in there and just be boring. It, he did it and he was popular. I don't know how, but, um, but, and then what they would do is they would pick a favorite and every video they'd take their, whatever they were doing and, but it's still, and it's like, obviously, all right, you, I think some companies like giving you a little giddy up to talk about your favorite. And, um, that's why in all my videos, I don't go back to saying this knife's good, but it's not the D bad. This, it's not this. I'm going to talk about the knife that that I'm that I'm holding. The only time is if I happen to have a knife on me, like I just did a, a video of a Devo knife, and it was good, but I was carrying this at mm -hmm. the time, and this one is a fraction of the price, and in my opinion, it's just better. And I made a mention of that. Didn't take away from the Devo. The Devo, I think, was still a great knife, um, but I'm not going to. If Kate Case gives me the the hammerhead. Every video I'm going to do, I'm not going to say, well, yeah, but, but daddy O knife, this, this is my baby. What, what did you find from the case double X, a, a knife I've always coveted too? Um, I, I found that they call it presentation. Bulls. <laughs> no, this knife is bad, man. Really? It is a serious freaking knife. I took it out every week for seven or eight and banged on it. Just used it doing the same stuff I do in videos seven months straight and uh then did a video on it after seven months after the initial video and um and just showed it performing after seven months and it just the it just performed like crazy so that knife since i got it all those years ago and i've i brought it on camp trips i've used it for seven months straight um i've used it in multiple videos doing hard use with it i've only honed it i've never had to sharpen that knife hmm. uh it comes razor sharp. It's got an immaculate finish. The, the, the polish on it is amazing. And it, it's just super strong, man. It's a great knife. It's a, it's not something I, I thought it wasn't going to be what it was because of how they named it. But let me tell you, it's probably one of the better of that style that I've ever used.
I, I okay, so I'm excited about that. I've heard other people, uh, you know, talk very excitedly about it, and it's something that you don't expect because it's case. And I have a a small collection of case. I like their um, chrome vanadium lines. Yeah. They seem to pay more attention they're, to them. They're always sharp, though. They're yeah. all that. And when they call it true sharp, they are truly sharp. They are yeah really sharp. They hold an, an amazing edge. They do a great job on their heat treats. They temper the hell out of them. Uh, Case does a really good job. It's why they're the number one collected knives in the world, you know? Plus, they're so good looking and they come out with so many different um, they can, you know, they can series and stuff. Yeah. They can design a knife. Oh, man. No kidding. That, that so, American okay. sod buster. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I have uh, I, I have several of their sod busters because you know they come in several you know two different steels they, and a bunch of different covers and they do I, I, I come in and out of periods of time where I got to get it all you know yeah um, and and so uh, I want to ask you who besides um, you know outside of your designs and your knives um, uh, who do you think does it best for the kind of knives you like like the large Bowies and the camp uh, well, camp knives and the big weapon. Knives. As far as who does it best and who I like the best, um, uh, Joe Mallinson, he's a guy that not everybody knows because he does really high end stuff. Um, Joe is amazing. Then there's another guy and these, these, I'll, I'll tell you the non mainstreamers first, Jed Hornbeak. Jed is the guy who, when I designed my D bad Nepalese gladiator and I can't show it to you because scab has it. Um, he's the one who made that. he, is one of the greatest knife makers I've ever seen. Lately, he's been getting more into designing different knives, and his designs are beautiful, man. They're so crisp. It's like I, I love to take a knife design and say, oh, too bad it's not this. Too bad. Nope. This guy, he can design a really good knife. I'm a big fan of Jed's. Um, man, out, outside of that, um, the guys over at Essie – they don't make a lot of big ones, but the big ones they do make, like the Hungless, um, it's it's an immaculately done design. I mean, there's nothing I could pick apart about that knife. I, I think it's you put it in your hand and you understand what's in your hand just holding it. There's no guessing. You don't. I wonder if I could do this with that. I want. No, you just know. You put it in your hand and it, it just it's an instant. Yes, it is. You know, it's for a, when you're talking about a big knife done right. Um, I would have to say the guys over at SE, um, and I don't know if they do collab designs or how they do it, but golly, man, they can they can design a knife the right way. They they balance them. They they make them. The, the grinds are perfect. Everything they do, um, I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of. I'll, I'll speak good about SE all day long. Um, and then you, you mentioned like Randall's and things like that. Some, some of those high end guys, they're high end for a reason. You know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. you look at like uh, K bar, I think K bar in a whole, they some really great blades, great steel, great heat treats. I think they're designing some of their handles are the worst I've ever felt. And it drives me crazy as a knife designer, because it's like, why would you do this when you had this great thing going and, and it just, bugs me. And then there, there's some others that come out there and there's some guys that do this fantasy crap. And I, I don't know. So I, I'm real picky um, when it comes to designs. And when you're talking about big designs, it's hard because I think the best big knife designers were alive a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're all just doing what they did over and over again, just slightly different. You know, because uh, actually, um, I, I wasn't thinking this when I asked you the question, um, but I was thinking more in terms of production houses, houses, production companies like Cold Steel and those kind of companies. But Tops, it occurs to me that Tops seems like the kind of company that you that that could uh, ex execute one of your designs. I have, I have well. a, a, a like, I have a bunch of Tops knives. I'm not gonna lie, I have a bunch of Tops. I, I really like Tops. Um, I think personally, they have the best differential heat treat mm. in the business, flat out best differential heat treat in the business. Um, some of their designs, I have a problem with some of their grips being way too small. Um, my silent hero, the front of it, I can't get a full fist on it because I have too much of a gap between there. The Prather war buoy does the same thing for my face. It's just, it's not made for every hand. And then some of them are just a little goofy looking or they'll like uh, he, they call it a, the war buoy. Like I love the, I love the Prather war buoy because I think it's gorgeous. 
Yeah. But when you call something combat, or it's just because you made it black, so now it's tactical, or it doesn't really make it what it is. They could have just called it like you know the the pocket buoy, or, or the you know what I mean. Give it a different name. But um, but yeah, so, some of their stuff, um, some of their stuff is just great to me, just great. Um, but I, I can really, really appreciate their differential heat treats. Um, I would much rather a tops blade over a cold steel blade. That being said, I will take that cold steel SRK to the grave. It's just a, a great knife. It's designed well. The, the trail master, the recon scout, just really, really good knives. They do they have some that don't make sense? Yeah, they have a lot. Uh, they have a lot of those. The problem with cold steel though is their inconsistencies with like heat treats and things like and sharpening. Some people just get them crazy that, dull. Some people yeah, get them crazy sharp. that seems to be a new problem. I've been collecting cold steels since the late '80s, and yeah, and 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 I have experienced a little bit of that recently. Um, I, I'll tell you, I had um, I got a Natchez buoy back when you know Lynn still had the company, and I put it in the stump to get ready to film. I just dropped it in the stump. And when I pulled it out of the stump, the whole tip had bent over. So oh, no. I was like, oh, that's dude. not supposed to happen. Well, so I, was I, had to, I had a big problem with them. Their customer service was horrendous. Oh. Um, I still have not gotten the knife replaced to uh -huh. this day. And that was uh, a couple of years before he got rid of it, got rid of the company. So a year and a half before he got rid of it, whatever it was. So Still, they won't they won't contact me back over it. So uh, the know. the reason I I actually wanted to ask you this is kind of a, a a weird question, but it's or a specific question. It's about the cable tang actually in the Natchez or Natchez uh, Natchez. I've been told I mispronounced yeah. it. Uh, that and the Laredo have the cable tang. What do you think of that? I think the cable tang is genius because of what it's made to do. Um, with the Natchez, the Natchez is a Western fighting buoy. It's what it is, right? And, and a lot of people say, oh, well, the cable tang is, makes the handle weak and you're going to break it, blah, blah, blah. Sure, sure you will if you're hitting a bunch of hardwood all day long, but that's not what it was made for. It was made for hitting me. It was made for hitting you. It was made for, that is a fighting knife. It's not made for that crap. If you use a knife or what it's made to be used for, there's a good chance it's not going to break because it's made for what it's used for. But a lot of people don't do that. They, they use things. And like when I test a knife, I test it. I know it's a fighting knife, but I'm going to chop a tree with it. And guess what? It, it worked. I didn't break my, my tang ever on my notches. And I've used that thing plenty of times. I, I think I probably have five videos of using that thing. And I've never had a problem with the tang once I had a problem with the company, but not the knife once well, once I got another one, and that's what I did. I got another one. I'm still waiting for them to send me you got, the one to replace that. You got and, the three V uh, one, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I, I have the yeah. O1, one, and uh, before that, I can't remember what it was. I don't know. I cheaped out. I got the forty one sixteen or or forty one thirty four, whatever it is. Uh, yeah. But I I just really had to have that Bowie, and and Beautiful. also my my thinking is also. Uh, the same as yours. Like, I I don't need 3V. I'm not going out and, like, uh, uh, chopping up uh, exactly. kindling and stuff. This exactly. is for there, the there's monsters. There's people rocking that SRK with, that, with the original steel. That knife's still going. It's because they're using it for what it's made to be used for. And that's the thing is cold steel, rather than coming out with new designs, they just use different steels. Yeah. It's just a ploy to get you the same – to buy the same knife because they're, they're telling you – that you have to buy this one now because this knife is so much better than that. Well, this knife sucked so much before. Why'd you make it in the first place? Well, they know the power of steel snobbery. That is a thing. Yeah. One, one upping people exactly with the it. steel. It's That's funny. exactly it. But it, it's funny because that same steel snob had that San Mai one for two years, cut everything under the sun, never had a problem. But because this one's M390 or the next great steel that's going to be, well, this steel sucks. I need yeah, that one. Yeah. It's, you can't it, cut I, anything I, with stops driving crazy. Can't cut driving anything with four forty C. God forbid it. Where you, you, I hear it all the time. Oh, you, yeah, you use that. Oh, that's a piece of crap. Oh, that's junk. And I just get done using it on on a video, a hard use video, and they'll say, "Oh, yeah, but you can't, you can't use that in real life because it'll break, or you can't use that because this." Show me where it failed. You just watched the video. Like, Show me exactly where it failed, and I'll. I'll give you a hundred bucks. You're like, this is and, real life, <laughs> but by the way. they can't, they, they just, all they do is this, but they, their eyes are so blind. They just watch something perform. And then they tell you it can't do what it just did. Yeah. 
<laughs> those, people, those, people, <laughs> those people drive me nuts, man. Yeah. <laughs> and, all right. So, Donnie, uh, I like to wrap every show with someone who has a YouTube channel and, and has opinions on knives. I like to do a speed round. Uh, right. So so uh, these are just a 16 or so quick questions and, and the one word answer. Oh, good. I suck at quizzes. Let's go. <laughs> all right. Fixed or folder? Uh, fixed. Flipper or a thumb stud? If Flipper. we're in, okay. Washers or bearings? Bearings. Tip up or tip down? Doesn't matter. Tip up or tip down? It really doesn't matter, but yeah, but you got to choose. Tip up, I guess. I don't know. Uh, see, I knew it. Conformist. I'm just kidding. Uh, Tonto or Bowie? Bowie. Come on, man. Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> Bowie. Uh, hollow ground or flat ground? Flat. Okay. Full guard or half guard? Uh, half. Full tang or stick tang? That's not even. That's not even funny, man. It's a full tang. <laughs> After this conversation, you know, uh, contoured handle or neutral or coffin style handle? Contoured. Uh, Condor or Ontario Knife Company? Ooh, man, that depends on the knives, I guess. Ontario. Okay. I don't know. Uh, Cold steel or work tough? I think I know. <laughs> um, I'd go with work tough for the heat treat. Uh, single Cold edge or design. What's that? Cold steel has better designs, but work tough definitely has a better, better wow. built. Yeah. Uh, single edge or double edge? Single. V ground <laughs> or apple seed? Oh, edge. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Sure. Well, sorry, what was the last one? Uh, v ground or convex edge? Uh, v ground. Finger choil or no choil? Choil. Form or function? Function. Okay. And then your uh, Desert Island knife. That's one knife you get to keep from your collection for the rest of your life. Everything else has to go. Everything else has to go? You know. And, and I, okay, we, we got to take out all sentimental attachments. Not a fair question, but I'm, oh, I'm keeping this. Beautiful. If I have one knife for the rest of my life, I'm so keeping something in case the dinosaurs come back. Yeah, <laughs> right on. Donnie, I think that's, I don't know, that's probably the one I would keep. But then again, I don't know, each new one that you held up, I was like, mm. <laughs> so I, I got to say, I, I'm, I, I really, really dig your designs. And I love that you're making big, unapologetic fixed blade knives because, um, you know, my interests go all over the place, but they always return home, which is this kind of knife. Yeah. You know, one of your questions, it was, it's funny to me because you said form or function, proper form creates proper function. So, I mean, they, it's the same thing if you've done it right. If you've measured your knife and you've measured, you've used, found them at mathematical mean and did everything right, your knife is going to be badass no matter what it looks like. Amen. All right. Well, let's, let's wrap with that, sir. It's been a real pleasure meeting you, Donnie. Yes, sir. And, and uh, for those of you uh, who are patrons, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to continue the conversation. Uh, so, uh, well, consider joining uh, Donnie again. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. All right, brother. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Donnie B. Old oh, day. Hey. Uh, the way he announces himself uh, uh, in his videos, I got to say, reminds me a little bit of my grandpa DeMarco. He was a bit of a ham and he had a couple of voices and a, and a few of those that Donnie does on his channel reminds me of him. All right. So uh, thanks again for Donnie for coming on this show and sharing his love of big badass knives it was uh, a great conversation i look forward to continuing it uh join us again next week for another interview and of course on wednesday for the midweek supplemental and thursday for thursday night knives live right here on youtube facebook and twitch 10 p.m eastern standard time on thursdays for jim working his magic behind the switcher i'm bob demarco saying until next time don't take dull for an answer Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob 
Bob at TheKnifeJunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of The Knife Junkie Podcast. 